the first of these uh, JLH69 amplifiers that I'm going to test is this one. It came fully assembled from AliExpress. It costs less than four dollars. A dollar fifty-eight for the amplifier and two twenty-six shipping. Well for this price I went ahead and got four of these and I did get charged one shipping charge for the four of them. The seller has a whole bunch of crap here but he comes down to the meat of the thing by saying it's 1969 amplifier. I don't know what a small group A is. They're assuming I can get 5 watts out of the amplifier. They seem to recommend a static current. Well, it's a class A amplifier, so it'll be a constant current. Somewhere around uh, 0.85. Everything else is just run-of-the-mill. The only identifying mark I can find on this board is this XR150 marking. I made a drawing of this amplifier, electrical drawing and a drawing of the board. I'm calling it amplifier number one, XR150. We've got an independently generated decoupled voltage here that's expressed across this voltage divider. And it has to be really noise free because this is tied directly to the input of the first amplifier. And it's just two 100k fixed resistors. We have a, a 0.15 microfarad input capacitor. Of course the transistors are all different than the JLH69 amplifier because the ones that are in the original article are no longer available. Now the second and third stage are always NPN and this designer elected to use a TIP 41C for all three of them. This is about what the JLH69 amplifier would have for an output capacitor, assuming an 8 ohm load. And I intend to place an 8 ohm resistor across the output, so I'm going to be testing at 8 ohms. In order to adjust the current, this has been a the JLH69 fixed resistors have been replaced with variable capacitor. So that allows us to set the current. Leslie Hood does recommend that these two resistors be a I believe a 1 and 2 watt respectively. This R7 is the same as all the rest. I, they're either quarter or 1 eighth watt. And this potentiometer is probably a half watt potentiometer. Everything else seems to be right in order with the original amplifier. For all the tests, I intend to use a 8 ohm resistive load mounted on this chunk of uh, metal. And it's uh, an 8 ohm 50 watt resistor. I mounted amplifier number one on a uh, heat sink. I, I insulated it with uh, silicon pads so the transistors are independent of the sink. This is what the test setup looks like according to the original article at 8 ohms, which I have 8 ohms on the uh, output. I should adjust it for 27 volts and 1.2 amps. And take note of this. Here's what uh, 
JLH said in his original drawing, all of this could be quarter watts, quarter watt, quarter watt. This was to be a half watt, and this was to be one watt. Set uh, 26.89, that's okay, and 1.18, which is close enough to 1.2. I'm using a uh, Lambda regulated power supply. I, like I said, there's an 8 ohm load here. The upper trace, the purple one, is the output from the signal generator. And right now it's uh, sit around 48 hertz and 0.66 milli, well, close to 0.6 RMS on the, what will be hooked up to the input. But look what happens when I hook it up. As soon as I hook it to the amplifier, I lose everything. As soon as I hook it to the amplifier, I lose everything. Here we are with the second amplifier hooked up. Call that an amp. This is 12 and a half volts. Looking at the oscilloscope, we've got a nice square wave from the function generator. Frequency is 50 hertz, and we've got this. Now, this is fairly straight, although it's a tilted. There's some curvature in this as well as a degree of tilt. If we look at the same oscilloscope setup in the original article. Now, this only shows the output, where on my oscilloscope I show the input and output. And you notice at 50 hertz it traverses up in the bottom. But it's symmetrically, bottom and top appear to be symmetrical. There's no curve to it. A little bit of curve there. Now the next test he does is at 50 kilohertz. And this is 50 kilohertz. Well, the top doesn't look bad. The bottom has a narrowing to it. Let's try 1,000 hertz, which is a common audio test. So there's 1,000 hertz. Now, for reference, the input voltage, RMS, The output voltage RMS is almost 5.9 volts. Well, 6 volts would be 4.5 watts RMS. So, what I'm going to try to do is crank up the current and voltage more closely to what JLH would recommend for an 8 ohm load. First, I'll increase the input voltage. Call that 20 volts and 1.3 amps. Go back to 1000 hertz square wave. I'm at 50 kilohertz. And that doesn't look bad. 10,000 kilohertz. That doesn't look bad at all. And I'm not putting an RMS voltage of uh, 8.8 volts, which is uh, pretty close to 10 watts. Looking at the temperature with my infrared thermometer, at the cap screw securing the transistors to the heatsink, I've got 32, 
maybe 36, 34 degrees Celsius. Which I don't believe is going to be a problem for those transistors. I go back down to 50 Hertz. The oscilloscope shows us essentially nothing any different. I'll go up to 50 kilohertz and essentially no change. JLH said that an input voltage of 0.66 would provide an output wattage of 10 and there it is. 500 we're getting a little bit of that tilt beginning at the bottom. There's 200, adjust the scale, check the frequency meter. That's at 180 hertz, which is beginning to look like the trace on the original design article. I still have an output of 8.8 .8 RMS volts, so that's a as close as you can get to 10 watts. The rectangle begins to look better as we go up in frequency. There's probably 600 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty close to what was originally intended. So out of two amplifiers, we burn one up, and the other one works fine. Let's see why it's important to have high frequency, uh, a range of, a capability of reproducing high frequencies. So this is a sine wave. at some frequency. This is a sine wave at three times that frequency. See we have one positive peak here and here we have three in the same time period. So this is a third harmonic. Adding them together produces a wave like this. It goes up faster than the fundamental sine wave. Then it does this where the sine wave peaks out it continues up and drops. So, do you see what's happening here? This is turning into a square wave. The third, well, the first and the third harmonic produce this. If we had the other har odd harmonics, depending on the correct intensity, we could make this a perfect square wave. The high, the very high. Uh, frequency harmonics, say the uh, the eleventh, would rise quickly here and giving us a good rise time. Well, all the odd harmonics between that would tend to make this as flat. But if we want to re reproduce this perfectly, well, if we want to make a perfect square wave, we might have to go harmonically up to at least. 15 times the fundamental frequency. Now, I didn't create any of these. I got them off the web. This is a distorted sine wave. You can see it's leaning. And it's narrower at the top than the bottom. This, of course, is a picture of the fundamental. It gets this lean and this characteristics power in the harmonics. This particular one is the harmonic energy is maximum at the second harmonic and diminishes the whole way. A square wave, if there was, this were a square wave, be a fundamental and all the odd harmonics. They're getting smaller, but they need to be produced exactly in order to reproduce a fundamental square wave. So that's it for number one. I'll pull out number two, we'll look at the kit, I'll assemble it, and I'll do the same test.